hands in your skin, and you will gain great and strange powers. Uh, so yes, uh, I'm Jonathan. I'm from Dark Shelf. We're talking with Nels Anderson from Campo Santo. Hey. Uh, we are at Gamer Camp, and we're talking about uh, video games and design and uh, systemic games. I guess is that the right term we're sure. looking at? Okay, you can so call them that. yeah, uh, you had a you had a salon series talk. How did the talk go, by the way, last night? I, I, people seem to think it was good and coherent. I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's, I, I, I'm happy with how it turned out. Mm -hmm. um, so, how transferable were was your education in, co in computer science to moving into game development? Like, what what did you learn there that you were able to use in your career right now? Sure. I mean, like, obviously, of course, being able to program is super, yeah. super, super important. Like. Yeah. It's it is tremendously advantageous being a designer who can actually implement your own ideas. Yeah. Like um, John Blow gave a really good talk, uh, I think it, maybe University of Texas, um, where he basically said programming is the last mile of design, and that's absolutely true, right? Because like you can tell someone to design a thing as much as you want, but ultimately like how a thing it's like this guy needs to you know this character needs to jump or whatever but some programmer actually has to say like when the a button is pressed gravity changes this blah blah, blah. and that kind of stuff actually has a tremendous impact on how the game feels so just being able to kind of do that stuff yourself and not needing to rely on other people to implement your ideas at least in like a gross prototype way and then you can say hey i kind of made this thing and it's garbage so maybe we could make it better together now <laughs> so that is tremendously important um so that like i i heartily recommend anyone who like is serious about design also at least get some understanding of like how to actually do proper programming um you talked about the difference between uh, designer directed games where you're kind of led along a path Sure. and player-directed games yep. where there's perhaps a bit more choice and or agency to the player mm -hmm. as to what they want to do to get to, let's say, the end of the game or the end of the level. Um, for you, is there any like certain threshold that uh, in a game like the amount of choices it gives you or the kind of agency it gives you for, for it to cross from director yeah. design, no. uh, di designer directed to player directed? Not really. I mean, like the, the, the idea there is just like, it's not, it's a, again, to emphasize, like, it's not a value judgment, right? It's not like one of these things are good and one of these things are bad. That's not what it's about. It's just like, it's just identifying, like, what kind of characteristics does this game have and what does it put emphasis on? And then it's just like, it's just, just like, the game, every game is going to exist at some point along that spectrum, right? Yeah. And it's just kind of like, the thing that I think is interesting is kind of the more player directed side doesn't get explored nearly as much. And it would be cool if kind of people paid more attention to that and explored that territory a little bit more. As far as player directed, the big thing that gamers talk about now, or like I suppose the buzzword, the buzz phrase is uh, choices and consequences. Mm -hmm. So uh, the first example most people talk about is Mass Effect, where the choice and consequence are often on like a galaxy-wide uh, sure. level. So, um, but you were talking more about games like Cart Life and Papers, Please, where the choices and the consequences, you mentioned scope. Um, there isn't necessarily a good or bad choice, yeah. um, and the choices have more real-world consequences. If that makes sure, if that makes mm -hmm. sense, or things that you might relate to in real life. So, right. there is a question be behind: Do I stamp a passport or or, or deny it? Um, and the consequence is: Like, can I afford rent or feed right. my family? <laughs> uh, as opposed to um, like a Mass Effect choice, where it's like: Do I save or condemn like a race to right. extinction? Yeah, and like those are those those kind of choices fall under very different ends of a spectrum. Yeah. So um, you, you seem to talk more about the uh, the personal or the real life choices. So mm -hmm. is there anything about those kind of things that relate more to real life that you find more appealing? Or um, this might be a leading question, but like taking whatever direction <laughs> you like. I mean, I hadn't really thought about it like that, but I think it's probably true in that like there's some level of you know, empathy or whatever when you're making decisions that actually resemble decisions you'd make in real life versus something that's clearly mm -hmm. fictional. Yeah. Um, but the thing that I think is super interesting about both Cart Life and Papers, Please is what they do is, and I think this is where some other games not necessarily fall short. It's just, it's, they do something different. Yeah. Um, because like, you're never given like an explicit like, oh, it's choice time now, right? Like every single moment that you're playing that game, you're kind of making decisions that are input that feeds back into the game systems, right? Mm -hmm. And that's super interesting while like, you know, Mass Effect or whatever, it's like you may pick thing A or thing B and it like, oh, okay, well in a little bit you'll see pre-authored content A or pre-authored content B 
and that's sort of it versus like, oh, I chose, you know, to do, to, to invest some of this stuff earlier in cart life. Is that still having ramifications for me now, two days later? And it ends up being, I think, a lot more tense, but in a good, interesting way. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's the kind of stuff that I love. I mean, <laughs> every choice in the game has been pre has been authored somewhere, like along this, along the design, the, the designer's like flow chart of one, of one way or another or a branching chart. Yeah. Um, how, how do you, infuse a sort of verisimilitude where it's like the choices resonate with the player as well as in the game and the, and the player characters. Like how, how, like how do you, like you can choose between like whether the Asari live or die or no, one of the races Mass Effect live or die, but like how does that resonate with the player as opposed to a, a kind of choice made in cart life? Right, I um, mean I think like, like you were saying earlier, like yeah. it is advantageous that in cart life like you're you're in situations that are just much easier to empathize with, right? Because none of us, none of us, is ever actually going to decide the fate of a race, right? But like being someone in an unfamiliar city, like trying to find your way around and not really knowing where to go, and then like you get on the bus, but you go to the wrong place, then you go to the other place, but then the stores closed. It's like that is stuff that actually happens, mm -hmm. um, and that's interesting because there's like a, yeah, there's just like a level of empathy there yeah. that lets you kind of do cool stuff. And then the, like those kind of specific narrative moments are then married with like the rest of the gameplay where you do have the simulation based thing where it's like, you have to buy stuff for your cart and then sell it so yeah. you can pay your rent. It's like, and that, those two things that keep coming back together and feeding into each other, super awesome. Um, and that's part of the reason why I specifically talked about those two games is because they do that so well that they actually take like specific narrative bits, put them together with like the game's simulation and have a delicious peanut butter chocolate dish. Yeah. I, it seems to me that the move towards director design games or um, designer directed games, sorry, yeah. is that there, there was this talk, that, okay, the standard comedian, Darrell O'Brien, he's from, I think he's Irish. Uh, he talked about the games are different from art forms such as film, television, and books in the sense that games are the only one that can actually say, if you're not good enough get past this point, then you are denied access to the rest of the rest of the uh, sure. of the art form. So it's not ex yeah. it's not like if you're reading a book and three book three chapters in it's like the book will suddenly say what are the top three themes of the book and then if you get it wrong it closes. It catches on fire yeah, and it disappears. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean <laughs> per perhaps like for for games to become more accessible to a wider audience, um, those those barriers are have been lowered perhaps. So yeah. uh, one comparison, System Shock 2 versus Bioshock or Bioshock Infinite, um, it's, it's kind of easier to get through the yeah. newer games as opposed to System Shock when you have to deal with like so many gubbins worth of, of data right. points uh -huh. and, and information and lore. Um, so how, how do you reach that balance between um, accessibility of, of, a, of a game and yeah. like um, variability such as Dark Souls you mentioned as well? Like, yeah. yeah, it's hard. Um, I mean, I think that the where that can kind of go wrong a bit is when it's like, oh, okay, well, we don't want this game to accidentally be off-putting, so we're going to make sure that people can't do anything wrong, right? So it's just kind of like you keep compressing the player's possibility space down further and further until there's just like this very tiny, narrow band of stuff that they're allowed to do, and that's it. Yeah. And I mean, that can be, again, it can, it can be fine for certain types of games, but it's really easy to do that stuff. Uh, unintentionally, I guess, and just kind of do it because, oh, we got to make sure people play the game right. Yeah. Um, and I think it's, there's a lot more freedom and like good potential in coming up with rather than, so, so the, the thing that I like about really more systemic but still character-based games, stuff like Dishonored, Mark the Ninja, blah, 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 is that the games themselves almost have this natural ballast in terms of like how challenging they are, right? Because the truth is, is that Mark of the Ninja is actually not that hard. Um, but because you can approach the game however you want, people are just kind of naturally going to select the thing that they find interesting and the thing they kind of find more engaging and enjoyable. So even though, s strictly speaking, maybe the game isn't quite as difficult because people are just choosing the thing that they want to do, it ends up just being kind of satisfying anyway yeah. and if people want the really hard thing they can ah they can choose the really hard thing um yeah, i think that like kind of difficulty and challenge is actually an incredibly important component of games um but it can very e it can easily be utilized in the wrong way yeah. right you were talking mostly about single player games or the single yes. player component of games last night um you said you wanted to talk you were thinking of talking about the multiplayer aspect in the sense that so there's you know a multiplayer games like Halo, Battlefield, they're with more than one player 
and potentially more than one scenario going on at once, there can be a huge amount of variability. Yeah. Um, but how how does that fit into your idea of like of systems and games and player directed experiences when you could potentially have so many different players cutting into each other's right. experiences or Daisy wise actively sabotage <laughs> actively sabotaging other other players um, right. yeah, experiences. I mean, like I hadn't part of the reason why I didn't talk about the multiplayer yeah. things is because I did I haven't dedicated really a sig significant okay. amount of thought to it. Yeah. But Let's talk it out now. <laughs> but I mean the thing that is interesting is like a lot of the, uh, like, if, if a, you know, as soon as you put another human agent into a game, like, all of a sudden you have this, like, potentially incredibly complicated source of different types of input and challenges and everything else. If, I mean, even if you be cooperative or competitive, it doesn't really matter. Um, and that provides, like, so much, like, experiential fuel or whatever that as long as you kind of design the game to not just have like one dominant strategy, right? Because obviously if there's just like, oh, there's the one best thing to do, so everybody does it, and then the, the multiplayer game is awful. Um, but if you don't do that, then you can kind of get away with just like letting the players be the challenge for each other, right? The systems are there to support facilitating a bunch of really different interesting interactions with each other, right? Like part of the reason why Daisy is so cool is that it's not just blast the other team to win, right? It's kind of like it's open and broad enough that it's like, are you trying to survive? Are you trying to like do this weird loner thing? Are you gonna be like a horrible, treacherous asshole and blast everyone that you can after you lead them somewhere dangerous? I mean, the fact that like all that stuff underpins the player experience and lets them like engage with each other in an interesting way, yeah. that's everything you need to make an obviously an incredibly compelling game. Thanks so much for your time. Awesome, thank you. Thank you for watching. This has been Jonathan Orr for Dork Shelf in Toronto. We've been speaking with Nels Anderson of Campo Santo at Gamer Camp 2013.